بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ما بعد أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يرحم لا يرحم من لا يرحم لا يرحم respected brothers and sisters today I will be addressing a very important topic history is absolutely crucial for Muslims in particular because nearly 30 to 40 percent of our scripture consists of history. Al-Quran, the book of Allah revealed upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam consists of histories of prophets. About 30 to 40 percent of the Quran tells us the stories of the past. the stories of the prophets and the purpose is to teach us lessons when the quran mentions previous nations like the babylonians the egyptians and mesopotamians uh, or romans for example why is allah mentioning these people or these nations is to teach us lessons so that we learn from their examples And Allah also states in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سيروا في الأرض فانظروا كيف كان عاكبة المكذبين Go in the land and see what happened to people who came before you, those who denied Allah. And then Allah talks about people who built monuments, people who did these great things. And if we don't take lessons from them, then we have failed. As someone put it, those who... fail to learn what happened before they were born, they remain children perpetually. They don't grow up. So, history is very important. That's why tonight's topic is on history. History of Al-Andalus in particular And this history we have to study very carefully. You have to teach your children what happened in Al-Andalus. The taking of Al-Andalus, then the rise of Al-Andalus, and the fall of Al-Andalus. These are very important topics. And each one of them is a separate lecture in itself. How the Muslims took the land of Al-Andalus. What caused them to reach Al-Andalus? What happened? the early Islamic conquests. Then, after Al-Andalus was taken, what did the Muslims do? Did they achieve anything? Or did they just devastate the land and leave it? Or did they remain behind and did something good by the land? Al-Andalus basically, basically is current-day Spain and Portugal. The Iberian Peninsula. It is also called the Iberian Peninsula. And in the past, this territory, when the Muslims took it, it came to be known as Al-Andalus. Why it was called Al-Andalus, there are many theories about it. Because previously, Vandals, a people, a Germanic people, had inhabited this land. Some people have this opinion that this land was called Vandalus. Okay? Or the term Vandalism, it rings a bell, right? Right? This is because these tribes had devastated the city of Rome once upon a time and they vandalized, vandalized the city of Rome. They sacked the city and they literally destroyed everything that came across. So the term vandalism comes from this word. So vandals were the people living in, a, in, in Spain or the Iberian Peninsula before the Muslims came. Then came the Visigoths. And Visigoths are the people who were defeated by the early Muslims. This is another story. So this was the early history of Al-Andalus, which we can cover another time, inshallah ta'ala. Tariq bin Ziyad in 711 CE, in the year 92 Hijri, landed at Gibraltar, also known as Jabal al-Tariq. And then within four years, most of the peninsula was taken. by a coalition of Berbers from North Africa, in particular Morocco, and Arabs. 
7,000 Berbers, 5,000 Arabs led by Tariq bin Ziyad. They took the entire peninsula within four years. And then followed chaos for some years, leading up to the leadership of Abdurrahman the first, an Umayyad prince, one of the grandsons of Hisham bin Abdul Malik, one of the most powerful Umayyad caliphs who ruled from 105 to 125 Hijri, 20 years he ruled from Damascus. Abdurrahman I, also known as Abdurrahman al-Dakhil, and also known as Sakr al Quraysh, in other words, the hawk, the falcon of Quraysh, he escaped Damascus because the Abbasid revolution was wiping out the Umayyads. The Umayyads were being exterminated. And Abdurrahman the first, Abdurrahman al Dakhil, was a young man in his early 20s escaping from this onslaught. He made his way to Al Andalus, long story short, and they chose him as the Emir to stabilize the country because the country was going through chaos because there was chaos at the center in Damascus and beyond there was chaos in one of the provinces called Al-Andalus. Abdurrahman I arrives in Al-Andalus and he stabilizes the country and he establishes his own emirate and he rules from Cordoba, the city of Kartaba and he establishes a masjid which stands to this day and now it is a cathedral why? Because when the Christ Christians took it later on, they built a cathedral right in the middle of the masjid. The masjid pretty much stands intact. You can go and look at the masjid. The pillars are there. The arches are there. The mihrab is there. So you can see the structure of the masjid still standing to this day, built in the 8th century by Abdurrahman I. And then followed a period of relative Stability, Umayyad Amirs ruled Spain from Cordoba for about 300 years and in 1031 the Umayyad Caliphate fell. And then followed a period of Muluk al-Tawaif. Muluk al-Tawaif literally means petty kingdoms. So when the center fell, then when the institution of Khilafah was abolished in Spain. Now, how did this emirate become Khilafah is a very interesting question. I can address this question in more detail later on at another point. I want to quickly move on to Moriscos, the topic of the night. First, it was an emirate or an imara established by the Umayyads. Then in the 10th century, one of the descendants of Abdurrahman I, called Abdurrahman III, claimed to be the Khalifa, the Caliph of the Muslims in Al-Andalus, because the Caliphate in Baghdad had declined and there was another rival Caliphate in North Africa called the Fatimid Caliphate, the Shia Ismaili Fatimid Caliphate, which was threatening the state of Al-Andalus. So to rival, to counter that claim of caliphate as the Abbasids had declined by this time in the mid 10th century, Abdurrahman uh, III, he claims to be a caliph. I am the caliph now of the Muslims. And he establishes a very powerful state. He invades North Africa to fight the Ismailis, the caliphate of the Ismailis, and he becomes very strong. So a lot of Muslims start to support him because of this claim. And then this caliphate lasted for another century. In 1031, it was abolished. When Ibn Hazm, a great scholar, uh, scholar of Islam, was alive. Very famous scholar. So, after this caliphate was abolished, the Muslim state of Al-Andalus, or the Muslim entity or principality of Al-Andalus, split into petty kingdoms. Many petty kingdoms. And this period is called Muluk al-Tawaif, kings of petty kingdoms. Right? Group principalities. So a small state, for example, would appoint an emir, and that emir would claim to be the king, and the kings sometimes claim to be caliphs. So one of the travelers, he said that I have never seen so many emir al mu'minins in my life. There were so many in Spain, right? So this division among the Muslims, political division, because all of them were fighting for their little petty states, 
to basically protect their petty interests, they were divided. And the Christian North, the Catholic North by this time, had gained impetus to take the land back from the Muslims. So they launched a campaign called Reconquista. In other words, the Reconquest. So they started to take land back from the Muslims. And this process started in the mid 11th century. 1066, one of the major strongholds of the Muslims in the north called Babastro was taken. Then 1085, the city of Toledo, also known as Toletala, was taken. And then for a while, the Murabitun or the Al Murabitun from North Africa, they intervened and they stopped, they checked the advance of the Catholics. Yusuf ibn Tashfin, a famous Murabitun leader, he led the armies of North African Muslims from Morocco into Spain to help the Muslims of Spain because um, there was one of the rulers of the city of Seville, his name was Al-Mu'tamid, he had invited Al-Murabitun to come and stop this Christian advance coming from the north. Someone said, are you going to become a shepherd of the camels? You're getting these camels to come in from North Africa? He said, I would rather be a shepherd for the camels than be a farmer for pigs. So he chose camels over pigs, right? And camels did come. Al-Murabitun came, they took the land and they were completely blown away when they saw the, the lifestyle of the Muslims in Spain. You know, this was designer lifestyle. I mean, if, if I was to draw a contemporary parallel, you know, Gucci... Gucci bags, huh? Gucci shoes, if you don't have good taste, right? You know all these flashy Louis Vuitton, it rings the bell, right? Go to Edgeware Road nowadays, you will see a lot of people wearing this kind of stuff, right? Similar things were happening in Spain, okay? Uh, Muslims of Spain had reached the peak of civilization in worldly sense, in material sense. In material terms, they had reached the peak of human development, achievement, civilization, uh, and there was nothing better than that in the world. If you were to say a worldly city today, let's say somewhere people want to go and see the pomp of this world, where would you go? What cities come to mind? New York, Las Vegas, they say. Some people say, I don't know, I've never been there. Yeah, Audu Billah. Okay, and there are other names people mention. Dubai is one of them. Yes, right? So, Qartaba or Muslim cities of Spain were like that. You know, they were not hubs of, uh, how can I put it, debauchery. There was no debauchery. There was no public promiscuity taking place. But they were very, very comfortable in their life. So, these desert Bedouins from North Africa, when they came in to help the Muslims, they saw the palaces, the fountains, and the pal all the, the luxury. The Muslims are they said, no wonder you're losing land. No wonder you're losing land. Because look at you, how you live. How are you going to fight these wild people coming from the north? They are battle-hardened. They are tougher than you are. You're all in your music and dancing and poetry and books and, you know, all of that, which is good. I mean, books at least are good not the rest, right? Yeah? So, but this is why you're losing land. But what happens with these people? They also become victims two generations down the line of the same problem. Al-Murabitun also become, you know, accustomed to that culture. Then come Al-Mawahidun from North Africa again, another dynasty. They also take land in Al-Andalus. They remove the Al-Murabitun from power and they take power, Al-Muwahidun. Al it is then when the greatest disaster takes place. Uh, in 1212, the year 1212, a battle takes place between Al-Muwahidun and uh, the Spanish kingdoms, a coalition of northern Christian Spanish kingdoms. They fight a battle uh, called the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa. Okay, Las Navas de Tolosa. 12-12, this battle took place. And Al-Muwahidun lost the battle. The king of Seville, also known as uh, Ishbilia, loses the battle 
against a coalition of Christian kings coming from the north. And that loss resulted in the loss of three major cities or principalities of Muslims in Al-Andalus. Valencia, Seville, and Cordoba. All of these three cities fall to Christians one after another in 1230s, between 1230s to 1250s. Okay, 1230 to 1250, within these 20 years, Christian kingdoms from the north, they take these three major principalities of the Muslims. Initially, the Muslims who came to live under Christians or under Christian kingdoms, they were called Mudijars. Mudijars, okay? And this term was taken from the Arabic word the, Arab, uh, the Arabic term Al-Mudajjar. Al-Mudajjar basically meant people allowed to remain. So, the population of Muslims in Spain in the 11th century was 5 million people. 5 million people. So imagine now these Christians have come from the north and they have taken cities after cities from the Muslims due to their weaknesses, their political divide and their petty gains and their petty uh, you know, concerns and ambitions. They are divided, they are broken, the Christians take advantage and they come and they take all this land from the Muslims. And this is what they were waiting for for centuries, the Catholics from the north. The, the popes ruling from Rome were always pushing the Christian kings from the north to take as much land as possible. Their goal was always to exterminate Islam from uh, Spain, to destroy Islam completely or or expel Islam or any traces of Islam from Spain. This is what the papacy had been doing. And it were the popes who launched the crusade as a campaign and many crusades took place from Northern Europe to the Middle East, right? And many crusades were launched against the Muslims of Spain as well. So Al-Mudajjars or Al-Mudajjar, which was the term used for Muslims living under Christian kings, Initially, they were allowed to live with their faith. The Christian kings who came to rule Muslim territories initially were very much inspired by the Muslim civilization. Muslim civilization was one of the greatest achievements of humanity at that time. There were great achievements in Spain when it comes to Christians, Muslims, and Jews. All three faiths prospered in Spain. They lived side by side. They shared knowledge with each other, great libraries were produced, great scholars were produced, great scientists, philosophers, intellectuals, thinkers, imams, theologians, muhaddithin, mufakkireen, uh, muballighin, and the, the list goes on. All sorts of uh, subjects and um, uh, fields of knowledge were taught in Al-Andalus in Spain during the Muslim period. And Jews and Christians benefited immensely from this knowledge in Spain. So this was the golden age of not only Islam, but the golden age of the Jews also. The Jews prospered under the domain of Islam for almost seven to eight hundred years. So long as the Muslims are ruling, the Jews prospered. Every time the Christians took the land from the north, the Jews started to feel threatened. In fact, they were expelled from many places repeatedly. So the Jews found refuge with Muslims. Muslims were protecting the Jewish people in Spain for hundreds of years. And these were the most civilized Jews in the world. They were the most sophisticated Jews in the world. And they found protection with Muslims. In fact, Bahia bin Pakuda, one of the Jewish rabbis, writes in 1180s, writing from Cordoba, when the city of Cordoba is still in Muslim hands, he writes that our living conditions, if, are, if not uh, the same as Muslim living conditions, but even better in some cases, even better. Our living conditions are in some cases even better, right? Some of the greatest Jewish scholars are born in Al-Andalus, in Spain, during the Muslim period. So when the Christians came in, they saw that the Muslims have established something amazing. Their libraries, their palaces, their civilization, uh, their scholarship, their books, okay, their universities, their institutions, they kept them as they, as they were. In fact, they started to translate these books, these works into Latin, and they started to shift this knowledge to the north. 
Then slowly this attitude started to change when more and more land was taken. 1250s onwards, there was only one stronghold left in Spain called Granada, also known as Granada or Grenada. Okay. The island of Grenada in the Caribbean uh, territory is named after Granada or Granada in Spain. So Granada lasted for nearly 250 years as the last stronghold of Islam in Al-Andalus in Spain. And they kept a good relationship with northern Christian territories. But Islam was very strong in Garnata. Islam was the way of life. The law of Islam was still applied. Scholars continued to flourish in Garnata. They reached uh, the peak of civilization, in fact. You know, Granadan uh, uh, Muslims. Many books from the northern regions Muslims had authored, written, transcribed. They ended up in Garnata because Garnata was the last stronghold. Many Muslims were actually emigrating to Garnata from the north because this was Muslim territory. It was easy for, to, for, for them to live with Muslims. So it was a very strong place and it was naturally protected. If you go to the city of Garnata today, you will see it is surrounded by mountains. It is right next to a famous mountain range in Spain called Sierra Nevada. Sierra Nevada is very close to Garnata and Garnata as a city is naturally protected by the mountains, natural fortresses. That's why the Christian kingdoms from the north could not take it for so long. But then in the 15th century, cut the long story short, fast forward, 1492 is the year. Actually 1482. Because this crusade against the state of Garnata continued for 10 years. For 10 years, two Christian states launched a crusade against the last stronghold of Islam in Spain. And these two, two states were Aragon and Castile. Aragon was ruled by a king called Ferdinand or Fernando and Castile was ruled by a queen called Isabella or Isabel, right? Both of them joined hands through marriage and they decided that they will wipe out the Muslim traces from Al-Andalus. They will wipe out, wipe out the last stronghold of Islam. Isabella was a diehard crusader. She was a very staunch Catholic and she wanted to remove any trace of Islam from Al-Andalus and she saw this as a mission of her life. Before she died, she wanted to achieve this. Long story short, a crusade is launched in, uh, launched in 1482. Ten years, the Muslims from Garnata are resisting this onslaught. A massive coalition is attacking them and they are resisting for 10 long years. There are battle taking place from castle to castle. They are taking fortresses, castles, cities, one after another, and they're not stopping. And Muslims are doing their best to do something about it. And one of the reasons why this is taking place is the fall of Constantinople. In 1453, Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih has taken the city of Constantinople from the Christians. And Christian Europe or Christendom was shaken to the core. What are we going to do now? The Turks are at our doorstep. And then shivers went down the spines of these Catholic monarchs in Spain. And Pope, the Pope was also shivering. So they were in fear that if the Ottomans woke up one day and realized, hold on a second, we have a Muslim ally in the Iberian Peninsula and we can easily land our armies because they controlled a lot of this coastal area. Hundreds of miles of Spanish coastal area was in the state of Garnata, the city of Malaga. You know Malaga? Was Garnata. Okay. So, they had this fear. So they wanted to wipe out this last stronghold. Ten years they started. Uh, for ten years they went on taking land from the Muslims. Then, in 1490, they started to negotiate with the last ruler of, ruler of Garnata to surrender the city because they couldn't take it. 
they had besieged the city of Varnata for one year and this was the largest army ever assembled against Muslims in Spain for reconquista for the reconquest of the land from the Muslims and this story is very disturbing Wallahi if you go to Spain which I did just less than a week ago I was in Spain and it was a very emotional experience Wallahi looking at those palaces those Islamic sites all the verses of the Quran on the walls and then you see shirk taking place right in front of them it is very difficult to see there are verses on the mihrab condemning shirk and then there is a cathedral right in front of that mihrab with idols all over the place a place free of idols a place dedicated to worshiping allah alone for centuries for at least 500 years from the time of durhman the first resurrected the masjid to the time when it was taken in the mid 13th century okay and now there are idols being worshiped literally idols you will walk in there you will see idols of humans jesus mary and other christian saints and the list goes on right idols of people in that masjid so it's a very emotional experience and you must visit you must some people say if there was a fourth holiest site of islam it would have been qartaba and it's not an overstatement it's not an overstatement you go and look at the masjid of qartaba in al andalus you will see why you will see why it was the largest masjid in the world for for, for some centuries it was larger than masjid al haram masjid al nabawi and masjid al aqsa it was the largest masjid in the world the compound still stands for for the last 1300 years it has stood strong the pillars are there the arches are there the names of the people who carved the pillars are there you will see the names of the people who carved those pill- pillars in the 8th century umar masud mubarak these are the names i read myself and some of the pillars have written the word lillah is inscribed on the pillar why the person wanted to carve the pillar for the sake of allah didn't want his name to be mentioned and it still stands so 1490 ferdinand and isabella they speak or negotiate with the last ruler of garnata called abu abdullah also known as bob dil in western sources or spanish sources is called bob dil it's a corruption of the word abu uh, abu abdullah he was the last ruler of garnata who he was what he was how he came to power another story we can discuss it another time when i get to the moriscos who are the moriscos so abu abdullah long story short doesn't stand his ground despite the advice by his generals and his people to fight to death because these catholics they are known for their cruelty or those particular catholics in case catholics start launching campaigns against me after listening to this lecture okay but those catholics are definitely very evil and brutal those guys in spain and you will see why the institution of inquisition was catholic it was a catholic in- institution supported directly by the papacy those popes those inquisition bishops and uh, clergy and those monarchs those kings and queens were absolutely evil for what they did to human beings so abu abdullah lost hope he knew there is no chance that they can resist any longer long story short he capitulates he agrees to terms and he hands over the keys to ferdinand and isabella and now there are hundreds of thousands of muslims living in garnata in the city of granada they're not aware what's happening they don't know one day they wake up to christian armies marching through the streets of garnata and christians are ringing bells from the the tallest buildings in garnata they are firing guns to announce their coming and they're singing songs of joy while the muslims are watching in silence in fear 
They don't know what's going to happen now to them. They are practicing Muslims. These people read the Quran. Some of them are scholars. Some of the women there are scholars, female scholars of Islam. And they are all covered. They do what we call parda. Or they are in hijab, in jilbab. They are fully covered. These women are not like the women of Castile and Aragon. These women are fully Islamic. Okay? So they are in a state of fear that these people now have walked in. So initially, one of the reasons why Abu Abdullah capitulated was that he believed the promise of these monarchs. The terms they agreed upon were, for example, these are the terms that were agreed upon. Before he capitulated, before he surrendered the city of Garnata to Aragon and Castile, a coalition of these two kingdoms, or, or a coalition uh, of a husband and a wife, both of whom happened to be uh, the rulers of these two kingdoms, Ferdinand and Isabella, he put these terms forward and they were readily accepted. So before the surrender, these are the terms that were put forward. That both great and small should be perfectly secure in their persons, families and properties. That they should be allowed to continue in their dwellings and residences, whether in the city, the suburbs or any other part of the country. That their laws should be preserved as they were before. And that no one should judge them except by those, the, those same laws, that their mosques and the religious endowments appertaining to them should remain as they were in the times of Islam, that no Christian should enter the house of a Muslim or insult him in any way, that no Christian or Jew holding public offices by the appointment of the late Sultan should be allowed to exercise his functions or rule over them. That all Muslim captives taken during the siege of Garnata from whatever part of the country they might have come, but especially the nobles and chiefs mentioned in the agreement should be liberated. That such Muslim captives as might have accepted, sorry, as might have escaped from their Christian masters and taken refuge in Garnata should not be surrendered, but that the Sultan should be bound to pay the price of such captives to their owners that all those who might choose to cross over to Africa should be allowed to take their departure within a certain time and be conveyed there in the king's ships and without any uh, tax being imposed on them beyond the mere charge for passage. That after the exp uh, expiration of that time, no Muslim should be hindered from departing provided he paid in addition to the price of his passage the tithe of whatever property he might carry along with him. That no one should be persecuted or prosecuted and punished for the crime of another man. That the Christians who had embraced Islam should not be compelled to relinquish it and adopt their former creed. That any Muslim wishing to become a Christian should be allowed some days to consider the step he was about to take after which he is to be questioned by both a Muslim and a Christian judge concerning his intended change. And if... After this examination, he still refused to return to Islam. He should be permitted to follow his own inclination. That no Muslim should be prosecuted for the death of a Christian slain during the siege and that no restitution of property, property taken during this war should be enforced. That no Muslim should be subject to, ha uh, to have Christian soldiers belittled upon him. Sorry, belittled upon him or be transported to provinces of uh, this kingdom against his will. That no increase should be made to the usual imports, but that, on the contrary, all the oppressive taxes lately imposed should be immediately suppressed. That no Christian should be allowed to peep over the wall, or into the house of a Muslim, or enter a mosque. That any Muslim choosing to travel or reside among the Christians should be perfectly secure in his person and property. That no badge or distinctive mark be put upon them as was done with the Jews and the Mudijahs in Christian territories. That no Muazzin should be interrupted in the act of calling the people to pray and no Muslim molested either in the performance of his daily devotions 
or in the observance of his fast or in any other religious ceremony, but that if a Christian should be found laughing at them, he should be punished for it. That the Muslims should be exempted from all taxation for a certain number of years. That the Lord of Rome, the Pope, should be requested to give his assent to the above conditions and sign the treaty himself. So these are the terms. Why did I read all these terms to you? So that you re realize why the Muslims surrendered the city and what was agreed upon. And they were expecting good treatment from these kings and queens. But Ferdinand and Isabella had no intention to keep these terms. They just wanted the territory. They wanted to occupy the last stronghold of Islam in Spain. And thenceforth, they would do what they want or what they wanted. As soon as the city of Granada was taken, the Muslims were initially tolerated. They were initially tolerated because the new rulers didn't want any disturbance. They could see that these are a very deeply religious people and we cannot possibly start changing them straight away. By 1499, and what happened when uh, these monarchs took the city? Firstly, uh, there were two bishops that came in. The bishop of the city of Garnata was appointed and his name was Hernando de Talavera. Hernando de Talavera was appointed as the bishop of the city of Garnata, a Christian bishop. And his approach was to reason with Muslims, preach the Catholic faith to them and try to convince them about Catholicism. Possibly not realizing because many Christian clergy at the time were very ignorant of Islam and Muslims, possibly not realizing that these people, they are trying to convert, some of them are scholars of Christianity. They have written books refuting Christianity. So how are you going to convert someone like that? Someone who's writing books on Christianity. There are books upon books in the libraries of Granata. Hundreds of thousands of volumes in the Arabic language. How are you going to convert them? So this is the attitude he had. Hernando de Televara. Then what happens is another bigot who takes over from him. Okay. Archbishop of Toledo, the city of Toledo in the north. He has a different idea. He comes and joins Talavera, or Talavera, sorry, Talavera. Hernando de Talavera. He comes and joins him. His name is Francisco Jimenez de Cisneros. Cisneros comes and he starts to arrest Muslim influentials and tortures them. He starts to torture them, torture them and forces Christianity on them. And he succeeds. By torturing many influential Muslims, they, they convert to Islam under duress, under torture. And then he reports to the Pope that I am, have converted hundreds, possibly thousands of people by torturing to Christianity. So they are encouraged now. They want to change the policy. They want to push Muslims to convert to Christianity. So the policy changes. Muslims are now harassed in the city of Granada. Muslims are being told to do things they don't want to do. Muslims are being told to baptize, to leave their faith. This results in a revolt. In 1499, literally seven years after the city of Granada is taken, there's a revolt. Okay, And this revolt goes on for another two years until 1501 when this revolt is crushed. And now, all gloves taken off. Gloves taken off. Okay? Now these Christian monarchs, they feel that they don't have to keep any treaties. They don't have to honor any treaties, any agreements with, uh, made with the Muslims. So this agreement I read in front of you was thrown into the bin. It was cancelled because of the revolt. Revolt was used as an excuse even though the revolt was caused by Catholic behavior against the Muslims in Garnata, uh, that wasn't considered. And uh, these terms were canceled. And now 
a choice was given to Muslims. Expulsion, conversion or death, you choose. You convert to Christianity, Catholicism, you get baptized or you leave the country for another country, which wasn't easy at the time, of course, or you die. Which one is it? Many, in fact, the majority choose conversion. They pretend to become Christians. These are the people who are known as the Moriscos. And Moriscos is a term used in a derogatory sense against Muslims who had converted to Christianity forcefully. They were forced, they were forced into Christianity or into Catholicism and they were called Moriscos, literally meaning little Moors. Little Moors. Now Moors was the term used generally speaking for Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. Moros in Spanish, Moros, M-O-R-O-S. And in English, it is Moors. Moors were basically North Africans, okay? Even though the majority of these people, native people of Garnata were Hispanic, ethnically Hispanic. Muslims of Spain, wherever they were, whenever they were, were Hispanic. The majority was always Hispanic. These were Spaniards. These were native Spanish people who had converted to Islam throughout the rule of Islam, throughout the period of Islam. And these conversions, they reached their peak in the 9th century, in the 850s after the Umayyads had come to power and they were ruling for almost a century already. And in the 9th century, these conversions, they reached their peak. Thousands upon thousands of Christians in Spain were accepting Islam voluntarily, not forced. We have evidence for that. We have strong evidence for that. Christians themselves writing at the time, we have their writings and they're complaining about it that these Christians are going to Islam. They are not even reading their Catholic or Christian commentaries on the Bible. There is a man called pa Paul Alvarus who was writing in the mid 9th century. He's complaining that these Christian youngsters are no longer reading the biblical commentaries. They are reading Arabic philosophy. They are reading books in the Arabic language and they know better Arabic than the Arabs. Some of them can utter, perform better poetical verses than the Arabs themselves. This is a Christian writing in the mid 9th century in Cordoba, in Cordoba. And to stop this movement or stop this conversion to Islam, a movement was launched called the Martyrs of Cordoba. These people, a bunch of extremists from the Christian community in Cordoba, they started to insult the Prophet as a, as a tactic, as a strategy. They started to insult the Prophet in public in front of the Muslims so that they get killed. This was the idea. The idea was uh, Islamic law was applied. The law at the time in Spain Anyone insult, insulting a prophet of God or God, it carried death penalty. At the time in Spain, the law was that anyone who insults prophets is going to be uh, facing the capital punishment. And they knew this. They knew this very well. So these Christians started to insult the prophet so that, so that the capital punishment can be applied against them. And when they are killed by the state, the Islamic domain the Islamic government of Spain then the Christians will feel sympathy for them and they will hail them as the martyrs of the Christian faith and then this conversion to Islam will stop but in fact most Christians disowned them most Christians in Kartaba they said we have nothing to do with these nutters these are mad people they have lost the plot they have lost their minds just as Muslims nowadays are always apologizing for the acts of few who do some stupid things here and there, right? You see the entire Muslim community go on this. And similar things were happening to Christians in Islamic Spain when Christians started to apologize for the acts of few and they started to disown these people, right? Why am I telling you this? So that you understand the majority of these Moriscos were native Hispanic people. Their ancestors had converted to Islam and they were Spanish. Hispanic, but they were always called 
moriscos or moros even though you are spanish some of them are blonde white blue eyes in fact some of the sultans who were ruling some of these spanish muslim states were white if you go today to alhamra palace okay and you see a depiction of the sultans on one of the ceilings you will see they are depicted they are painted by a contemporary painter some of them have ginger beards sultans of garnata muslims they look they are white you look at them they are white some some are dark skin others are white because their mothers were white right so they were mixed so many of these moriscos in fact the majority the overwhelming majority were hispanic hispanic and they had a mix no doubt with north africans because the al murabitun came al muwahidun came they ruled this territory they were very influential they intermarried with people local people to this day if a dna test is carried out on spanish people of the south al andalus you will see north african dna and it can be traced back to those north african rulers and those people who inhab- inhabited the land so these people moriscos when the city of granada fell abu abdullah the ruler he left with his entourage for morocco he went to morocco and 200000 muslims from granada left with him they didn't want to trust the christian christian monarchs and the catholics they didn't want to trust them they were left with abu abdullah those who could afford to leave those who were rich others stayed behind people muslims in the countryside they stayed behind these were called the moriscos and then they were forced fully they were forcefully converted so 1499 they revolt and the treaties are cancelled and now they are told to convert or die and then majority of them convert but it doesn't stop there it doesn't stop there the law is made the treaty is cancelled and now these people are christian officially they are now christian officially but they actually not christian they are practicing islam in secret they are called moriscos previously they were mudejers mudejers were muslims living under christian rule is that clear now mudejers okay have now become moriscos their status has changed mudejers were muslims living under christian rule the mudejers now have become moriscos because now their status has legally changed moriscos are now converted newly converted christians from islam and they are no longer seen as muslims they are now seen as christians who had to who had to practice christianity as the catholic saw it and they were checked they were tested whether they are actually christian or not so what started to happen initially when this law was made and you know what at this time 1501 1502 when this revolt was suppressed the first revolt of the muslims against these evil uh injunctions imposed upon them one of the results one of the outcomes was isabella the queen she ordered the burning of all arabic books this was one of the greatest disasters in the history of islam two libraries that were destroyed in the history of islam we will never know what we lost there and these two libraries were potentially the greatest loss to islam in terms of our literature and evidence of islam early evidence of islam what two libraries are those sorry baghdad everyone knows what happened in baghdad the siege of baghdad the mongol invasion in 1258 baghdad was taken the last abbasid caliph was killed his name was al mustasim billah he was killed and one of the outcomes of this siege or this capture of baghdad or this destruction of baghdad was that the library of baghdad was entirely thrown in to the river tigris dijla the river dijla 
River Tigris became black. First, it became red due to the blood of the Muslims that was spilt by the Mongols. And then it became black due to the ink of the books that were thrown into the river. Now, I can only assume and imagine that there were Qur'ans there written by the Sahaba or from the time of the Sahaba. There were Qur'ans there from the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th century of Islam. This is when the Mongols came in. There were books of Hadith that we have never seen before. That we find mentioned in the books of early scholars. There were books on poetry, literature, science, philosophy, you name it. Millions of books were thrown into the river and we will never find them again, never, never recover them again. Similarly, in 1501, uh, Isabella ordered the burning of the books of Garnata. Allahu Akbar. I saw the square when I was there just over a week ago. I saw the square where these books were burnt by this uh, um, bishop called Cisneros. The one who came to impose Islam on the Muslims. Cisneros, he personally supervised the burning of these books. All the Qur'ans, all the books of Hadith, all the literature of Islam, all the tafsir, all the commentaries on the Hadith, all the books you can imagine the Muslims had accumulated in Garnata from all over Al-Andalus. The entire legacy of Islam in books was burnt, went into flames. Over a million books, it is estimated, were burnt at that time. So what happened? These Muslims now started to hide their books. Because now keeping an Arabic book was a crime. You can no longer keep Arabic books. And it is estimated that there are a million people. Even though 200,000 have left with Abu Abdullah, the ruler, to Morocco, almost 500,000, half a million to seven, 800,000 people are still behind. Some even claim a million. That a million Muslims are still around and they are called Moriscos. Legally, they are now Christians. As far as the state is concerned, they are Christian. But they were not Christian. Some did convert, no doubt. Some few unfortunate individuals did convert. But majority of the Muslims, they pretended to save their lives. So they would go to the church and they would stand there. Okay. They would even at times do things that Islam does not permit, eat pig, because they were forced to eat pig. Inquisition was an institution that was unleashed against, against them. These clergy, these bigoted evil satans or shayateen working with this institution were a bunch of Catholic clergy. And they were basically given this task to make these people Christian by hook or by crook. So they would go to their homes and they would check them systematically if they are actually practicing Christianity. Are they eating pig? They would have to hang a leg of a pig in every single Muslim house. And then they would make them chew the meat. They would make them drink wine. If a Muslim or if an individual in Garnata was seen to be too clean Muslim, this is not a Christian. Because one of the greatest signs of Muslims was they were clean. They were hygienic. They were very tidy. So if you were too clean, you would be taken to the Inquisition. They would be interviewed, tortured, to confess. Okay? And they were not allowed to pray. No salah. No Eid. No wudu, no ghusl. If anyone was seen bathing on Juma, on Friday, they were picked up. They were taken. And they were tortured. In some cases, tortured to death. Women were not allowed to dress as Muslims. They had to uncover. You know, this is not a joke. When you actually think about it, when you read about it, you know, the problem is we are not aware of this history. We are completely blind, completely ignorant. We don't know this happened. And you know what people cry about the Holocaust and other catastrophes that took place in the history of humanity? Rightly so. These are catastrophes. But one of the greatest catastrophes, one of the greatest genocides, one of the greatest exterminations, one of the greatest 
ethnic cleansings that uh, ethnic cleansings that took place in human history wars in Spain against the Muslims of Spain after Spain fell to Catholics so they were not allowed to pray now they were facing a very difficult situation they were so much in love with Islam that they wanted a solution then came a fatwa called the fatwa of Oran the fatwa of Oran what is the fatwa of Oran anyone knows So in 1501 or 1502, some Muslims write a letter to a scholar in a place called Wahran. Or a scholar from Wahran. Wahran is basically in current day Al-Jazair, Algeria. This scholar was Sheikh Abu Abbas Ahmed bin Abi Juma Al-Maghrawi Al-Wahrani. So the letter was written to him the Muslims of Spain were complaining or they explained the situation that this is the situation we're living in we cannot leave if we leave we'll be killed because they couldn't leave those who tried to leave were systematically robbed on the way and most died on the way in fact the Jews immediately were banished the Muslims were uh, not immediately expelled because they were in huge numbers hundreds of thousands of people how do you tell them to leave it's going to become a logistic nightmare and the city will be empty there will be no city of garnata there will be no business there will be no agriculture so these monarchs they realize that they have to be pragmatic about it and they have to find a long solution for muslims for the jews out the jews in 1492 as soon as the city of garnata fell out and most of them were killed on the way the jewish people and very few made it to morocco and algeria and tunisia so the jewish people who were still living in morocco algeria libya and tunisia until the 1940s were actually originally hispanic these were spanish jews sephardic jews so they were completely wiped out Muslims are in large numbers. So these Muslims wrote a letter to the Mufti, Mufti Abu Abbas Ahmed bin Abi Juma Al Maghrawi Al Wahrani. So they asked him. So the Mufti responded by telling them that we have been made aware of your situation. It is a very difficult situation, no doubt. So in your case, you should, uh, out of necessity. out of necessity in your case in your circumstances you can eat pig to save your lives because you are under duress you can even drink wine and one of the things the inquisitors and the catholics used to do with the muslims to confirm they knew they knew these muslims they will go to church and stand there and pretend that they are christians these muslims they will eat pig they will eat pig yani once if they are forced they will eat pig they will even drink when they are forced to drink but the most difficult thing for them is what the most difficult thing for them is what ha huh? no shirk of course yes no salah could they could pray salah this is i'm coming to the fatwa insulting the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they knew these catholics knew that these people will not insult their prophet okay and wallahi this was the most bitter cup to swallow for the muslims the muslims could not insult the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but on pain of death they were told to insult muhammad or you die or you die and many of them they did this they knew of course they were scholars they knew the story of ammar bin yasir how he was tortured and he said something he didn't want to say and he went back to the prophet so they knew so the mufti he sent them a response and wallahi this became the most popular text among moriscos among the muslims of spain or the muslims of garnata at the time now the muslims of spain pretty much had concentrated in garnata and there there's another place called valencia 
one of the huge numbers of Muslims was in Valencia. They were also now Moriscos because they were previously Mudejars, Muslims who were allowed to practice their faith under Christian rule. But now, after the fall of Granada, they had also become Moriscos because later on, in the early 15th century, 16th century, sorry, early 16th century, 1500s, when Charles V was ruling, they were forcefully converted due to a rebellion which was called the Rebellion of Brotherhoods. The Rebellion of, or the Wars of Brotherhoods. Long story, that's another topic, we can discuss it another time. But as a result, many Muslims were forced into Christianity. And Charles V, when the question came to him, Charles V was the ruler of Spain at the time, and he was the Holy Roman Emperor. When the question came to him about these, the status of these people who were forcefully converted, he said they remain Christian. And they became Moriscos too. A large, a huge, hundreds of thousands of Muslims living in Valencia. So Garnata was going through what I told you already. Valencia also became a victim of this inquisition. Then these Muslims were facing extreme circumstances. But in secret, they were still practicing Islam. They kept the Islam, even though they had to eat pig at times, even though they had to uh, drink wine at times, even insult the Prophet Sallallahu Billah, may Allah protect all of us, Wallahi. You know, the Muslims of India, I can see this coming to them. Because the same thing that happened in Spain is happening right now in India. Is happening right now in India. You know, when these Hindu extremists, when they tell Muslims to say, Jai Shri Ram, Jai Shri Ram, you know, they, talk, they tell them to... Uh, uh, in Persian, there's a saying, you know, nakle kufar, kufar nabashud. You know, narrating kufar is not kufar itself, right? So when I say this, don't, don't put fatwas on me. He just said it, right? Okay, this is what the Hindu extremists in India are telling the Muslims. They stop Muslims and they tell them, say this or you die or you get beaten. This is exactly what was happening in Spain. And you know, one of the things these Hindu extremists in India, these terrorists, Wearing, uh, wearing saffron, uh, you know, what, this, what they're saying? That these Muslims, their population is growing. They're breeding like rabbits. They will outnumber us. If we don't do something about them, if we don't do ghar wapsi, ghar wapsi literally means bringing them back to home. What home are they talking about? Bringing them from Islam to Hinduism. If we don't do that, if we don't force these Muslims to, to become Hindus, then they will outbreed us. They will outnumber us. This is exactly what the Inquisition and the Catholic clergy was saying to Spanish kings. Deal with the Moriscos. Their numbers are high and they will outnumber us by breeding because they don't go to war. They are good in business. They are getting richer. If you don't change their religion, then they will outbreed us. Demographics was one of the biggest questions in the minds of inquisitors and the kings of Spain at the time when they were oppressing, suppressing and brutalizing Muslims. This is why they were doing what they were doing because they were clergy, just like there are Hindu extremist clergy in India pumping this hatred against Muslims and brainwashing the Indian masses, the ignorant Indian masses about the threat of Islam and Muslims in India, this is exactly what, you know, history is repeating itself. You read about Spain and Moriscos and you look at the state of the Muslims in India, you will see the parallels. I'm not going to say any more. You go and do your calculations. So, these people now are facing an existential threat. They are still not trusted. Even though they are going to church, they are outwardly expressing Christianity, they are not trusted. And rightly so. The Inquisition knew that these people are a bunch of munafikin to Christianity. They are hypocrites. Why? They profess Christianity in public, but in private they are Muslims. So to them, they were hypocrites. They were pretending to be Christian. They are heretics. Heretics to Christianity. So it is okay to torture them, to brutalize them, to do anything against them because they will never become Christian. And that is true because they were very learned Muslims. So the fatwa came to them. The fatwa tells them, in your situation, you can even do all these things. You can even insult the Prophet. In your situation, you will not be held accountable. 
Because what does the Quran say? What does the Quran? Those who commit kufr and they hate it in their heart, there is no blame on them. And this verse was revealed about Ammar bin Yasir radiallahu anh, about his case. So this became the most popular text in among the Moriscos. And there is a translation of it in Al Jamiado. Al Jamiado was a language the Moriscos had pioneered to do the secret correspondence with each other. Al Jamiado was basically Spanish written in Arabic alphabets, in Arabic characters. And there are many texts that still they are extant and they can be found in different libraries in Spain and beyond, right? Al Jamiado was the language used by Moriscos to communicate with each other because the Christians, the Catholics couldn't read that language. Okay? So there is an Al Jamiado translation of that fatwa uh, from 1564. It exists almost 60 years after the fatwa came. Okay? And this is how we know the fatwa exists. And this was one of the most popular texts at the time. So the Qadi, the Mufti told them to pray with gestures. You don't have to pray like Allahu Akbar. Yani. You know, you're visible rituals. Don't pray like that. Pray with gestures. You can pray with your eyes. You want to do charity, you want to do zakat, just go and help a beggar. Just help a beggar. Don't make it Islamic. Don't make it seem Islamic. Okay? Then they came up with code words. Instead of saying Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah, they would say something else. Okay? Quran was out of the question. They couldn't be found with the Quran. They would be killed. So, nowadays, in Spain, Many old houses, when they are going through renovations, when walls are dropped, you find Arabic manuscripts in there. You find hidden books, which were hidden by the Moriscos. And they wanted to hide these books. They wanted to cling to them because they wanted the attachment to the deen, al-Islam. Okay. So, then what happens? Uh, this situation continues. But in the countryside outside of Granada, the Muslims are pretty much practicing their faith. It is impossible to monitor them because it's such a large number of people. You will need an army to stand guard on top of these people to make sure that they become true Christians. So they are doing their adhans, they're doing their salah, they're doing their Islam for the next 50 to 60 years. Then in 1567, Philip II the king of Spain, he realizes that something has to be done because the clergy are again whispering to him that these people, they are the fifth column. What is the fifth column? What is that? Does anyone know? The fifth column. An enemy from within because the Ottoman threat was rising. The Ottomans were already in the Mediterranean Sea and they were threatening not only Spain but all of Europe. All of Europe, okay? And you see, all of this history is intertwined. All of this history is very interesting and intertwined. The Ottomans were, during the period, during the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent, were very active in the Mediterranean and beyond. To the extent that in 1571, one of the biggest naval battles in European history took place. The Battle of Lepanto. The Battle of Lepanto between the Ottoman Navy and a coalition of European navies. And the Ottomans lost the battle because this was a very huge navy that came to fight them for their existence. The Ottomans were threatening, threatening Europe. Okay, In 1533, the city of Vienna was besieged by Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. And 40 years later, this battle takes place in the Mediterranean. So the Spanish monarchs and the Catholic clergy, clergy are shivering in their pants that if these Moriscos, the fifth column within Spain, if they, if the Ottomans invade from the coasts of Varnata or close by, these Moriscos will side with them. And they will find hundreds of thousands of people fighting for, for them. So this is the fifth column. 
we have to do something about it you have to really do so 1567 philip the second announces another decree that no muslim dress code allowed no arabic language on pay to pay, even in the countryside by the way now granada is already done with but this is now surrounding areas where the muslims are still alive in hundreds of thousands no arabic language no islamic names no arabic names you have to now call yourselves gonzalez or uh, speedy gonzalez or some you know those spanish names or mexican names that we know today you know fernandez and uh, i don't know hidalgo or something like that i don't know what names i know all these names from cowboy movies yeah <laughs> so you have to change your names to these spanish names no arabic names no salam no arabic no islam outwardly or inwardly outwardly uh, inwardly of course they can't do nothing but outwardly gone no identity nothing to do with muslim identity haram forbidden on pain of death you will die now the moriscos have realized that we were somehow surviving in secret practicing islam we were still you know going by getting by but now is is now another revolt 1568 moriscos get together in these mountains called al pujarras mountains or al puharras mountains that are very close to granada if you go to the city of granada granada about 2 hours drive you will get to these mountains and you will see these mountain <coughs> this mountain range muslims were living in these mountains so they came together and they were united by the last muslim leader of al andalus you can call him the last muslim leader of al andalus who stood up for islam militarily his name was bin hamaya bin hamaya okay he had a spanish name given to him but he was called bin hamaya which is a corruption of ibn umayya ibn umayya why was he called ibn umayya he was called ibn umayya because he traced back his lineage to banu umayya so he used that lineage to become the leader of the muslims said i am descended from banu umayya the very people who established the caliphate in spain and i now lead you so for 3 years ibn umayya led the muslims in al in al pujarras mountains from 1568 to 1571 many bloody battles took place many spanish soldiers were killed and muslims were killed okay and eventually uh the king he defeated the muslims and this last resistance this last resistance unfortunately was crushed and now an order was given to exterminate to exterminate these people okay because now the ottomans are around the corner and even britain is threatening spain 1588 the famous battle of armada you know the famous armada battle yeah when spain came to take england and you know who the queen elizabeth the first was allied with you know who was she allied with any any ideas the ottoman empire she was allied with the ottoman empire she was in basically uh in alliance with the sultan of the ottomans and there's a book titled the queen and the sultan check it out it tells that story the queen and the sultan right so this was very dangerous situation for the spanish there are people inside spain who don't like the catholic government of spain there is britain england ruled by elizabeth the 1st at the time and there are ottomans so they said okay extermination in 15 1582 the king of spain and his clergy and his advisors get together and they discuss the morisco problem how do we deal with this problem they are not leaving islam they will keep still keep secret islam with them what do we do so some of them they argue that we commit a genocide we kill them all hundreds of thousands of people we just round them and kill them all just kill them okay just get rid of the problem who's gonna other said no 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 this is too much okay then some said castrate all the men castrate all the men get the men get all the males castrate them so that they cannot have children anymore that's it problem over one generation gone finished right then they said this even this is going to cause another revolt because now you see the the why are the revolts taking place because they are still around in huge numbers so these ideas are basically put aside 
Some Spanish nobles were arguing to leave them. Why? Because they were expert agriculturists. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were taking care of agriculture. They were taking care of business for them, right? So they were in favor of leaving them alone. But then these Catholic clergy, these bigoted, hateful Catholic clergy, Islamophobic Catholic clergy, they didn't want that. They wanted to cleanse. Finally, in 1609, King Philip III, who came to power after his father, Philip II, who was the one who decreed, uh, who issued the decree in 1567 that caused the revolt. His son, Philip III, when he comes to power, he decides to banish the entire population of Moriscos from Spain. Whether they are Christian or not, even if they are sincere in Christianity, even if they are sincere, out. Out. So in 1609, from 1609 to 1614, Moriscos were told to leave for Morocco, for Africa, or anywhere else. And this, wallahi, this expulsion of 1609 to 1614 is a very, very sad story, which needs a lecture of its own. And I cannot indulge in details because time is nearly up. So Moriscos, because this is the end of Moriscos. Muslims came into Spain in 711 CE, and this happened in... 1609. So almost 900 years Muslims are in Spain. People say 700 years or eight. Muslims are still in Spain for 900 years, up to the year 1609, in huge numbers. They were hiding the Islam. They were keeping the Islam in secret. They didn't let go of it. And then when they landed in Morocco, the Moroccans attacked them, thinking that these people are basically, they, the Spanish have sent them as spies or to attack us from within, so they didn't accept them. So they ended up in very difficult situations. In fact, when some of them came to the coast to travel across the channel, they were already robbed dry by the time they came to the coast. And Spanish ships, they were charging them heavy amounts of money. They wanted heavy amounts of money. So they had to choose now. If the adults remain behind, that's another Morisco who wouldn't be allowed to stay. And if they leave the children behind, they will be raised as Catholics. They will be left without the father and the mother. So many parents had to make the difficult choice, the choice that allowed both the parents and the children to live. And what was that? To leave the children behind. They had to leave hundreds of thousands of children behind with Catholics. And they were converted, of course, forcefully to Catholicism. And Muslim parents, they crossed the channel to the other side, to Morocco. There are still Andalusian quarters in the cities of Morocco. You will see them. Some rich Moriscos, Muslims, they ended up in the Ottoman Empire. They went to the, territory, the Ottoman territories that took refuge there. Many of these Moriscos, because they were very bitter about this, they joined the pirates, the Barbary pirates, who were invading the coasts of Spain from time to time, they became the pirates who were attacking the Spanish ships, and any European ship for that matter. There was a huge, famous personality called Khairuddin Barbarossa. Who knows about him? Put your hand up. Khairuddin Barbarossa was a Barbary pirate, okay, who was active in the Mediterranean, and I'm sure he had Moriscos helping him. Moriscos joined the Ottoman militaries later on. They became helpers of the Ottomans. Some even went as far as Egypt to work in Egyptian, within the Egyptian state, Apratus. These are very learned people in many cases and many, 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 many of them very able people. And they were originally Hispanic. They were Spanish people. But because of the Islam, they were never trusted and they were thrown out of Spain. They suffered daily. Their story is absolutely fascinating. This is a story of heroism, resilience, resistance, and faithfulness. Wallahi, Moriscos, some of the examples are so amazing that you will see how they tried to keep the Islam under extreme circumstances. What I have given you today is only an introduction. Okay, if you want to know the details of what happened to them, there are books written by scholars on them. One of them was authored in the 19th century when the story of Moriscos actually came to light. Most people in the world had no idea who Moriscos were, what happened to them. Only Spanish people knew, Spanish historians and Spanish authors knew. But uh, this story came to light when in, an American historian wrote on the Moriscos. His name was Henry Charles Lee. 
Henry Charles Lee authored a book titled The Moriscos of Spain and it was published in 1901. The first edition was published in 1901. This is when the story of Moriscos came to light and people were blown away. Later on, another book you can read if you want to read a relatively a relatively recent work by a Muslim scholar. Uh, it is by Anwar Shahna. Anwar Shahna, Shahna, his name is spelt, his surname is spelt with C-H-E-J-N-E. -E, okay, you may think this is a strange spelling of Shahna, but this is how his name is spelt. Anwar, A-N-W-A-R, Shahna, C-H-E-J-N-E. -E, okay, and the book is titled The Moriscos. Google it, you will find these works, inshallah. And there are many more academic works authored by recent scholars who are discovering a lot of amazing facts about um, Moriscos. And even the discovery of some of the Morisco manuscripts in Al Jamiado, in the language they were writing in, are absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, in fact, there is a text found in Al Jamiado by a man, I forgot his name. He wrote, he was writing to the Moriscos, uh, you know, of his region that remained steadfast on Islam. And he was telling them how to practice Islam and don't leave Islam under any circumstances for this kufr. Writing in Al Jamiado in Spanish with Arabic characters. So, this is a very powerful, a very painful, a very inspirational story of a people who resisted uh, extraordinary odds against them and they stood by their faith and most of them never gave up Islam. In fact, as late as 1727, as late as 1727, there was a case, there was a trial in Spain where some Moriscos were put on trial by the Inquisition for practicing Morisco rituals. <laughs> Can you believe it? As late as 1727, the 18th century, okay, people were practicing Morisco rituals or doing Morisco things. What is that? Some Islamic things, right? Okay, so this is a thousand years from the time Muslims first arrived in Spain, 711 to 1727. There are still traces of Islam in Spain as late as that. Some scholars have discovered that Moriscos are still around very much. They even found secret ways and languages to survive, to keep Islam. There were secret uh, societies, if you like, to keep Islam. They had secret language. They had code words to greet each other. They had mastered ways to keep whatever Islam they could. And finally, in the 18th century, you can say all traces of Islam were completely removed. Can you imagine that a people ruled a territory for almost 700 years and none of the graves can be found today, with few exceptions? Their graves have been completely wiped out. The Catholics came out to wipe out Islam and any trace of it, but they couldn't wipe out Al Hamra Palace or the Masjid of Kartaba. You will still see Islamic sites in places like Ornata, Seville, Valencia, Alicante, Toledo, okay, uh, Almeria. The list goes on. You go to these territories in Spain, you will see the traces of Islam. You will see monuments with Arabic writing on them, with the verses of the Quran on them. And one of the places brothers are telling me is like uh, a casino now. It's a casino and there are verses from the Quran or Arabic verses on the walls. There are places standing to this day. So finally, my brothers and sisters, I will stop here. It's a very long story. You can read some of the books I have already mentioned. Henry Charles Lee, The Moriscos of Spain, and Anwar Shahna, The Moriscos, and you will see many more details. In fact, if you want to read a recent, a more recent work, it is by L.P. Harvey. L.P. Harvey. Uh, Harvey. Uh, he has authored this book, Spain from 15 to 1609. 1500 to 1609, if I'm not mistaken. From 1500 to 1609, this is the Morisco period. This is the Morisco period in Spain. L.P. Harvey, okay? A very important book if you want to go academic. That's a very good book, book to consult, okay? So there are many stories I can tell you that I simply don't have the time uh, to go through them, but you have to go and look into these books and research this topic in more detail so that you can come across 
more about moriscos and learn from the example and their suffering and see how this should happen never again never never this story needs to be told to save your brothers and sisters in india and china possibly okay this story needs to be told these things have to be learned you have to talk about them you have to do research you have to do workshops so that you save yourselves and your future generations from similar treatment thank you so much for listening walhamdulillahirabbil alamin wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh